One year ago this month, I received my certificate in permaculture design. Permaculture is a philosophy and practice of ecological design that's shaped around three principles, earth care, people care, and fair share. In the words of the co-originator of the concept, Bill Mollison, quote, the philosophy behind permaculture is one of working with rather than against nature, of protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless action. Engaging deeply with the world through this lens has been the most impactful spiritual experience for me since seminary 20 years ago. My favorite topic of the eight-month course was pattern understanding. One of the most common patterns is branching. We witness branching wherever there is a need to collect or distribute materials or energy. Branching reveals itself in tree roots, tree branches, coastlines, lightning strikes, stream patterns, lungs, and meandering garden paths. Stick with me. In the ecology of learning to follow Jesus, the God he called Father is the vine grower. This God is maker and creator of all, the source of all life and all energy. Nothing exists without this God. The only reason there is a creation, and you and I in it, is because of the unimaginable energy and power of this God who chose to create ex nihilo, out of nothing, from scratch. And the energy of this God is distributed via branching. When Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he is not me merely grasping for a metaphor, but teaching us how reality works. The very energy and life of God flows through the vine and out into the branches. To flip that order is to overflow, overthrow reality itself by making ourselves the originator and energizer of life. It's to assume that we are the vine, which is just vainly imagining some alternate reality in which we are in charge, which is no reality at all. When we try to build a so-called life outside God, we wither and die. Jesus' language of branches withering, being thrown away and burned may feel startling or even frightening. The late Christian philosopher Dallas Willard made what I find a really helpful distinction he said that Jesus is not speaking here of a destination, but a diagnosis. Jesus isn't sending people off to hell, but describing how God's reality truly works. Withering is just what happens when a branch gets separated from the vine. And when it gets separated, it's good for firewood, but not for fruit. If we can understand these basic principles of the created order, Jesus is saying, let's also see how God is at work. The life and love of God flow into the vine and out through its branches. And just as with a grapevine, the only way to bear the fruit of the Spirit is to remain in the vine. There are no hacks or tips or shortcuts to otherwise. This is how God's holy energy is shared with us and flows through us, being united with the one who called himself the vine. So, if God wills that our lives bear the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., and if we bear fruit only by abiding in the vine, then our responsibility and our summons is to abide with Jesus. The word translated as abide 
occurs 42 times in the whole Bible. 23 of them are in the Gospel of John and the first letter of John. To abide is to have a fixed place of rest, to remain, to stay, to wait for, to continue, to remain constant in, to have no better place to be. St. Irenaeus in the second century wrote, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. So in 2024, 18 centuries later, what does it look like to be fully alive? What does it mean to abide in the vine who is Jesus? I'd like to suggest three small experiments in abiding you could, draw, you could try this week. Pick one. First, keep the Sabbath. Our age is marked, maybe even defined, by the protracted and thoughtless action that permaculture cautions against. We shoot first, and then we ask questions later. We do and react and defend and reply all without even pausing to think. We have bought into the lie. I have often bought into the lie. That productivity means doing something or cramming more into less time. True productivity or growth, however, involves radical pruning and pruning can be painful. Pruning means saying no to that which is crowding out God's life within us so that we can actually have some space to say yes to God's larger yes for our lives. Even the retired folks I'm talking to are complaining how busy they are. To me, that speaks that this is not a personal issue primarily, but a broader systemic issue at play with how we define our worth and our our identity as busy or doing something. Thankfully, God knows us better than we know ourselves and prescribed a speed bump to help us slow down. It's called the Sabbath. Or to paraphrase the fourth of the Ten Commandments, you should really take a day off. There are different ways to define that, and lots of nuances based on personal circumstance and stage of life, and I get that. And I still believe that God commanded the Sabbath for a reason. Try it this week and let me know next Sunday how it goes. Second experiment. Find your focus. As an aside, with productivity, I used to think it meant making sure you get to the last thing on your list. And what I've learned over the years, both as a Christian and as someone who operates in this field, is that it's much less about what's at the edge and much more about what you hold in the center. And so this next one, find your focus. Um, Years ago, during a really profoundly difficult season professionally and personally, I came across a book by an Anglican priest and author named Arthur Bors. The book is called Living into Focus, Choosing What Matters in an Age of Distractions. Incredible book. In it, he urges us to pay attention to the moments when we can affirm the following statements. There's no place I'd rather be. There's nothing I would rather do. There's no one I would rather be with. This I will remember well. As an an experiment this week, it's less about a to-do and more about paying attention. If there's a moment this week where you find yourself actually taking a breath or laughing or feeling truly present, you might ask yourself those questions Where am I? What am I doing? Who am I with? Scribble it down on a piece of paper and hold it close 
because the answers to those questions are the window into what it looks and feels and smells and tastes like to actually abide. To even for a few minutes have no better place to be than exactly where you are. Final experiment. Practice resurrection. The phrase comes from the Wendell Berry poem, Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. The poem concludes, as soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. Every day you tune in to the news of the rumblings of war and the chattering of politicians. For the next four weeks, I'd like to invite you to tune into a different frequency as well. The good news that Jesus is risen from the dead. If you don't think it takes practice to do that, you're wrong. It does not come naturally to anybody, and someone has described the spiritual, dis the spiritual disciplines as extraordinarily non-addictive. OMG Tuesday starts this week, and we're going to be dwelling together with the first letter of John. Why not register today and practice resurrection for four weeks? Another way to practice resurrection is to spend time with others seeking to live a life of faith, because if you think you can do it on your own, you're wrong. Consider becoming an ambassador for our Giving for Growth campaign. You'll get to know fellow parishioners who call this community home. Those who've been involved in these conversations have found them enjoyable and life-giving and affirming. In summary, three small experiments in abiding with Jesus. Keep the Sabbath. Find your focus. Practice resurrection. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. May we dwell with Jesus so that God's love might bear fruit within us. Amen.